The basics of Redis are pretty much as simple as it can possibly get. I can do set some key to some arbitrary value, and then I can get the same key, and I get my value back from the database. At its heart, Redis is a key value database that can act just like a giant durable hash map if you want it to, but it can be much more powerful than that, and we're gonna cover that in this video. Redis was actually voted the most loved database on Stack Overflow's developer survey for five years in a row. Remind you of something else? We're going to walk through how you might build a real world backend using Redis or any Redis compatible data store. Most of the example is relevant whether you're using Redis itself or any other Redis compatible data store, like the one that we're gonna use, which is called Upstash. Upstash is a serverless Redis compatible database in the cloud that has a pretty generous free tier, one that many applications can sit comfortably in, maybe even forever. We can actually create an Upstash database pretty quickly. We just go to upstash.com, go to the console. Once we're in the console, make sure we're on the Redis tab and then click Create Database. Give it a name and you can choose regional or global. Regional puts your database in one AWS region and global puts your database in potentially more than one AWS region. More on that later. But for now, we'll just do regional and select US West 2 and click Create. Done, that's it, our database is ready to go. To go ahead and connect to the database and test it out, we can use the Redis CLI for that. And if you already have the Redis CLI installed, you can just copy and paste the command provided here. If you don't have it installed on a Mac, you would do brew install Redis. So let's copy that, paste it into the terminal. So now we can execute arbitrary Redis commands. Cool. Get and set works kind of like a hash map of strings. You can set an arbitrary key to an arbitrary string and then get that key and you'll get that string back. A lot of folks that use Redis compatible databases might only use the get and set commands, but the Redis API has some more powerful data structures, one of which is called sorted set. A sorted set allows you to assign one or more values to a specific key, and each of those values has an associated priority, and the priority dictates what sorted order those values come back in. Say we're going to the zoo and we have a set of animals that we wanna see, but we know we can't possibly see them all, so we wanna assign all of them a priority and look at them in priority order. The command for adding values to a sorted set is called zadd. So we can do z add and then the key and then the priority value and the string associated with that value. So we're gonna add giraffe with a priority of 100. And then we can look at all the values in the sorted set using z range. We wanna look at all values that have a priority between zero and 100. So we specify the beginning of that range, zero and then 100. And then we'll do with scores because we wanna see the priorities that along with the values that come back and we'll display them in reverse order. So we get what we expect. Giraffes at the top, then flamingo, then gorillas. One interesting thing about sorted sets is that if all the members have the same priority, they're gonna be sorted lexicographically. And that can come in handy as we'll see in a little bit. Okay, so what we're going to build in this video is the backend API for a hypothetical journaling app. If any of you have used an app called Day One, really fantastic app by the way, if you haven't tried it, we're going to build some APIs that are a simplified version of what they might have in their backend. Basically there are many users, each of which have zero or more journal entries associated with them. Each journal entry is identified by the data was written. We're going to store journal posts using a Redis key of the format user ID colon date, and the value is gonna be the contents of that journal entry. We're going to build this using a full stack Rust web framework called Leptos. Don't worry if you're not familiar with Rust, we won't be doing anything too crazy. We're going to have two very simple APIs to start with, one for creating a journal entry and another for retrieving a journal entry. That'll give us a good foundation and then we'll move on to building some even more powerful APIs. I have the Leptos scaffolding for these APIs already set up, so we can focus primarily on the Redis client related code. I also have a pretty rudimentary web UI to help us make requests to these APIs. So let's look at what these two APIs are gonna do in the Redis CLI. Create entry is gonna do a set, so it's gonna do something like set bob colon and then the date and then the contents of the journal entry. So uh, watched a football game and a parade. Cool, and then get entry is gonna do a get on that same key. So get Bob 0101. 23, and we get the contents of the journal entry. Later in the video, we're gonna change create entry to do a little more than just a set, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now let's actually implement these APIs in Rust. Again, I have a Leptos application already set up here, so all the scaffolding's in place, the functions are in place. First, we're gonna create a function to create a Redis client object, and we'll call this function from both the create and get APIs. To avoid putting our Redis password in the code, we're gonna load that from an environment variable. So we let password equals env var. And our environment variable is going to be Redis CLI auth. We won't be doing any error handling here to keep the code clean. Then based on that password that we get from the environment variable, we're going to create the connection string. Then using the connection string, we'll create the Redis client object. OK, 
Okay, that compiles. Now let's move on to the get entry API. From that client object, we're gonna get a connection. Then we're gonna build the key that we wanna get based on what was in the request. So we have a user ID parameter and a date parameter. So we'll use both of those to build the key. And then we call the connections get method to get the value associated with that key in the database. We'll print out the result just to make sure we're, we get what we expect. And then we're gonna wrap that value in an okay result variant and return it to the caller. Okay, let's see if that API works. We already wrote an entry in the database for January 1st, 2023, so we'll test that. Cool, okay, so that get API worked. We get the value that we associated with that key earlier in the video in this log here. All right, now onto the create entry API, and it's gonna start out pretty similar to how get entry started out. We create a client and then we create a key based on the parameters that came in the request. And then we're gonna call the set method of the connection. This is actually gonna be a let statement. And the let statement is actually to facilitate type inference. You don't actually have to do this, but it makes it a little bit cleaner. So you could actually just call connection.set and not actually assign it to anything, but then you have to use a turbofish operator and specify types for things and it just gets a little more messy than doing it this way. So we're gonna keep it clean and do it this way. That should be all we need for now. We're gonna add some more stuff to this API as we implement get entries in a little bit, but for now it's as simple as just calling the set method on the connection. Let's test that out. We're gonna do Bob again, went for a run today, and then the date is gonna be the second of 2023. We'll do set and then Bob 010223, get entry. Cool, went for a run today. So that's our set API. I don't think I explicitly mentioned this, but you do need to add the Redis crate to your project. So yeah, just do a cargo add Redis to get that crate. Now that we have these entries in our database, let's go ahead and go to the Upstash dashboard and look at the billing section and see how we're doing in terms of, are we gonna fit in the free tier? Do we need to upgrade? Let's see how we're doing there. Okay, so we can see we have a whopping 440 bytes in the database. So I don't think we're in any imminent need to upgrade to a paid plan. You can see 185 requests. That's because I was doing some testing prior to the video, but we only made a handful of requests during the video. So if we look at pricing real quick, the free tier is, like I said in the beginning, pretty generous. We get a lot of these things with the free tier, including a 10,000 daily command limit, which your app would have to be fairly popular to exceed that. You do get global replication in the free tier, which I'll go over in a minute, which is actually pretty nice. And you get 250 megabytes of data size. Unless you're storing images or video in your database, you'd have to store a lot of data to hit that 250 megabyte threshold with text. So you'd really only need to upgrade if you need to exceed that 10,000 command a day limit or that 256 megabyte data size limit. Or if you want some of these features like multi-zone replication. Multi-zone replication is AWS data center. So Upstash runs on AWS and AWS data centers have multiple kind of subregions within one region and that's for redundancy. So if you want multiple databases within one AWS region across two, they call them availability zones, you would want to upgrade to the paid plan. The other thing to note is that if you do go with the paid plan and your usage drops down below the thresholds of the free tier, the scales back down to $0 a month. So say your app is really popular and your usage is fairly high, it's exceeding that free tier limit. Maybe it's seasonal and you only get a heavy usage during certain parts of the year and you drop down below that free tier threshold, your billing will scale back down to $0 a month. That's pretty cool. I kind of skimmed over this in the beginning when we created the database because this database is single zone. But when you create a database, you can actually specify which regions you want to replicate to. So let me go ahead and delete this database and we'll create a new one so you can show you replication. When I click create database, let me name it. I can select regional or global. And with regional, I select one AWS region. So US West 2 is closest to me. If I select global, I can actually select a primary region, which is the region that all writes will be directed to. So I'll do US West 2. And then I can select one or more read regions and requests originating from our backend, depending on where they're geographically located, they're gonna be automatically routed to the closest AWS region. That's pretty cool. This is for reads only. Writes will always go to that primary region. So I've selected US West 2 as my primary region. In the free tier, you can select up to one read region. So I'm gonna 
select my one read region to be US East one. It's all read requests to the database will be directed to either of these regions, depending on where that request is originating from. So if I get a request to my backend running in US East one, and my backend needs to make a request to my Upstash database, that request should be routed to the Upstash database running in US East one. Upstash is actually featured in quite a few of the templates on Vercel's website. For example, there's a Dolly art generator example that uses Upstash to persist image URLs. As for how it stacks up against other cloud-based Redis compatible offerings, let's consider AWS MemoryDB. AWS MemoryDB does give you two months free if you use the smallest instance size and stay under 20 gigabytes of data. But after that, you're paying a minimum of $35 per month, even if there's no data in your database. Also, MemoryDB isn't serverless. You're forced to be aware of the underlying EC2 instances that you're using. Okay, so now that we have entry creation and retrieval working, likely what we'll want our hypothetical front end to be able to do is to query for all entries within a specified date range. To accomplish that, we can use the Redis sorted set data structure to allow us to determine which of a user's journal entries are in that specified range. So we have two entries for Bob right now, one for January 1st and one for January 2nd. We did wipe the database uh, since we created those, but I've recreated them in this new database. What we need to do to facilitate this access pattern is to add a sorted set with all the dates for which Bob has entries. So eventually what I'm gonna show you is gonna be in the create entry API. We'll add the code for that later, but we're gonna do Z add Bob colon entries. And the Bob colon entry sorted set is gonna have all those dates. And they're all gonna be a priority zero because if everything in the sorted set shares the same priority, you can sort them lexicographically, which is what we want for dates. So we're gonna give it priority zero and then we're gonna do to get this to work properly, we also have to have the year as the first element in that date, the month as the second, and the day as the third. In the examples we showed in the beginning, I think the year was at the end, but we're gonna reverse that now to get this to work properly. So now if I see what dates within a certain range Bob has entries for, I can use Z range, and then Bob colon entries, and then I use strings to specify the range that I wanna search for. I prefix each string with a bracket or a parentheses, depending on whether I want this query to be inclusive or exclusive. So in this case, I want it to be inclusive of the start date. So we're gonna do bracket 2023 and then exclusive of the end date, 2023 we'll do 05, and then by lex, which means sort lexicographically. And I get what I expect. I get those two entries that we added earlier. Okay, this is all well and good, but how do we retrieve all the contents of the entries within the specified date range? Our sorted set only has the dates. It doesn't have the contents of the entries. This is where we get to see one of the really powerful features of Upstash and the Redis API, which is Lua scripting. You're going to love this, especially if you're a NeoVim user. We can actually write Lua scripts, which run on the database server, and we can use the output of one command as the input for another. So at a high level, what we wanna do is we wanna query this sorted set for the dates for which there are exist entries. And then once we get the results back, we wanna query each of those entries to get the contents for that entry. We're actually gonna put this Lua script in the root of our project directory, and we're gonna load that file from our REST code and then send that to the server every time this get new get entries API is called. Okay, I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but the broad strokes are, we're going to call zrange like we showed in the Redis CLI, and we're gonna get the results from zrange. For each entry in the result we got from the zrange command, we're gonna call the get command for the user ID colon, and then the date that came back from the zrange command. And in that way, we can get all the journal entries from the requested timeframe using only one Redis command. Okay, now let's look at what calling that Lua function from the Rust code looks like. We have our get entries API here. Again, it's gonna start out pretty similar to the previous previous ones. We're going to set up the connection. Then we're going to read the script file from disk. So we create this script struct, which is defined in the Redis crate, and then we're gonna get the result, and we're gonna pass some arguments to the script. First is gonna be the user ID, next is gonna be the start date, and then the end date. And then we invoke and we pass in the connection. And then let's look at the result. And then we're gonna return the result from the function unless it's of an error variant, in which case we'll return an empty vector. We're not quite ready to test yet. First, we need to add that extra Z add to the create entry API. Otherwise, the sorted set that the get entries command uses will not be populated. So the key is gonna be the user ID colon entries. And then we're gonna do con.z add the add key, date, and a priority of zero. 
and that should do it. Let's test this out. For get entries, user ID is Bob, start date is January, or we start with the year now, 2023, 01, 01, and end date, we're gonna do the whole month. It doesn't really matter. There's only two entries, but January 31st is gonna be the end date. Let's see if that worked. Okay, that worked. We get a vector of all the dates of the entries that were within that range that we requested, and also all the contents of those entries immediately following each date. So now that we've built this simplified journal app API using Upstash, as long as we stay under the free tier daily command limit and 256 megabytes of data, you'll be comfortably within the free tier and not pay a dime. If you do expect a higher volume of traffic or data, you could upgrade to the premium tiers. The pricing does scale back down to zero with your needs. If you don't need the premium features anymore, you can seamlessly return to the free tier. Joe Emerson, CTO of an insurance company called Branch, said that switching to Upstash reduced their database bill by more than 90%, among other benefits. It's also worth noting that The Verge, a very popular tech news website owned by Vox Media, uses Upstash as their data store. That's an overview of integrating a Redis compatible data store into your Rust app. If you're interested in a really easy to use cloud-based Redis compatible data store, check out Upstash. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.